go back to the beginning. Hi. Right. Okay, I'm coming from a slightly different angle, actually. Um, but that was very interesting, and, I'm, and we're going to be testing some knowledge of what that last presentation with one of my slides is remarkably similar. Um, so I come from the field of global learning, global citizenship education. Um, until very recently, I worked on a very large government-funded program in the UK called the Global Learning Program, where we had nearly 8,000 schools by the end of it engaged in some way in uh, global citizenship education. And if, as you can imagine, the last couple of years, the sustainable development goals have become particularly popular within the global learning world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that, some of the opportunities. Um, first of all, though, I want to start with a couple of pictures, because the, the, the conversations about the way education, teacher training, the curriculum needs to be going, I think have uh, two big global issues at the background. Here's one, and here's another one. Okay, so put together, I think there's sort of two um, trends. The first one is, is obviously talking about the inevitable AI robot takeover. It's from a, a French photographer, Vincent Fournier, from his um, a series called Speculative Fictions, where artificial creatures interact with humans. Um, I'm not such an expert about that, although I love to talk to people who know a little bit more than I do. The second one is the world and the doom and gloom scenario from climate change to um, some of the issues that are coming up here today. Um, and the calls, both of these trends seem to be asking for a more critical global citizenship in schools. In particular, the first one's talking more about critical digital literacy, critical um, intelligence with the technology, um, and, and the second one, perhaps more critical global citizenship. And although they're not, these trends aren't massively talking to each other yet, they're both calling for a, a shift away from the three traditional pillars in education of um, arithmetic, reading, and writing, to have more empathy, creativity, and critical thinking. Um, also problem solving, but I'm, I'm not so sure about that one. If, if we get time and questions, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about why I've got some concerns with that. But both of them wrestle with all sorts of doom and gloom scenarios, and uh, this is very difficult to get into schools. It can seem very overwhelming and complex, and, and, and the task of getting global learning, critical global citizenship, and themes from the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a big one. It's a really tough one. Um, and I've been reading recently, and I, I know it's been translated into many languages, Hans Rosling's uh, Factfulness. Has anyone heard of that? Factfulness? Hans Rosling? Hands up. Anyone heard of Hans Rosling? Oh, there's a few hands. Um, he, him and his... Uh, he sadly passed away last year, but his son, uh, Ola, and uh, Ola's wife, Anna, have written this great book, Factfulness. And um, it's was derived from some research, 14 countries, about people's perspectives of the way the world is. Um, and I'm going to throw a few of the questions at you, and plus a couple of extras. We'll go very quickly, because I know time is of the essence today. Um, here's the first one. In 1950, there were fewer than 1 billion children um, in the world. By 2000, there were almost 2 billion. How many do the UN experts think there'll be by 2100? Hands up, A, 1 billion? Two billion? No one knows that was that. Three billion? Okay, four billion? Yeah, most people answer three or four. It's actually two. We've reached the age of the peak child. Um, and uh, here's another one. The population distribution, which map best represents the way the world is. Um, is it that A, B, and C? Um, we haven't got too much time, so I'll go straight for the answer there. It is, in fact, B, which is often not... Um, uh, people don't often come up with the right answer. Uh, Hans Rosling talks about the pin code of the world being 1114. Um, average life expectancy, 50 years around the world. So average around the world, 50 years? Yeah, 60 years? Yeah, 70 years? 
Yeah, in 70 years, and that's always underestimated too. You get where I'm going with this. The sort of world is not such a bad place. Um, <laughs> uh, literacy rate. I might be going to catch you out in a minute. What's the literacy rate for adults in the world as a whole today? 80%, 60%. 40% getting into the, into the hands up thing now. It's 80%, it's better than we think. Uh, and because of the theme today, um, this wasn't one of the questions they asked, but which has the largest number of persons born in the country who now live outside its borders? Um, I'm not gonna go through them. Anyone think they know the answer? Brave enough. No, it's India. And, and that, uh, the others are very high, but India is the highest. Um, and this came up in Agnes's talk just now. In the UK, in uh, the world that we're in, the depression of Brexit, um, when asked to guess what percentage of people in the country were foreign born, the average person guessed if you remember from what was uh, on the big range of statistics, do you remember? It was, that's what they guessed. But the reality, I think we must have different stats because the reality was nearer 13, but I think you had 8.4, so maybe there were different things on that one. But anyway, essentially, it's that perhaps the, the way we approach some of these issues has to be thought through carefully, that the media creates, as we know, stereotypes, and we need to find a way of challenging them with educators in partnership, in collaboration. And through some of the global learning work that I've been involved in, we often start with this great activity with teachers, community groups, students. What's the world like? Here's some images. Um, uh, top left one, I think. Yeah, is the, is the refugee camp in Jordan that was in the first presentation. Uh, uh, what's the world like? We often start with NASA's iconic image in the middle and people throw words at it. And often they're quite negative. It's, it's big, it's dangerous. Uh, but then you get the opposites. It's getting, it's, um, getting more integrated. Um, and then we say, what skills, knowledge and values do we need young people to have to live in that world? And how are we currently meeting that need through schools, through education, through higher education at the moment? And what, what ways do we need to develop that? How do we need to get better? Um, we have some frameworks out there to play with. Uh, traditionally, um, a lot of schools I've worked with work with um, the United Nations Convention of, of the Rights of the Child, um, and obviously the United uh, a nation's declaration on human rights too. The bottom image is a list of goals put in, in a, uh, a way that perhaps might be less familiar, but they're obviously the global goals. Um, and what's really interesting with these global goals and why we've begun to find that they have been a really useful tool for communicating global learning and the need for global citizenship is that they have been translated, I think marketing team got involved, um, into something that is more accessible internationally, globally, but also across curriculum subjects, across different interests. And actually, one of the organizations I've worked with over the last couple of years is the world's largest lesson. Hands up, anyone heard of the world's largest lesson? Yeah, linked to Project Everyone. Um, and their latest image of this is actually as a jigsaw. And I think that's really important because obviously all those goals are profoundly interrelated and are mutually supporting. Um, I scribbled down just the issue of sort of migration. Um, it, it, as they're, they're, they're mutually supporting, the nature of these goals uh, means that we can explore their economic, social, and ecological dimensions. Um, with, with an issue like migration, we obviously know that migrants tend to be more at risk of poverty, goal one, less access, access to quality education, um, goal four, which leads to growing economic inequality, goal 10, um, there's links between migration and climate change, goal 13, and many others, and that has consequences for health, food security, water availability, etc. They are all profoundly interlinked, and this, is, this I think, has been why 
they've been a really useful tool for getting some of the core skills, values and knowledge we need to meet the 2030 agenda into schools. Um, for anyone that works in this might be familiar with 4.7. Um, that's where I and my work and people I work with firmly sit. And that has a clear identification of the need for all countries to be embracing and supporting sustainable development education in some way. And uh, there's a lovely picture of some students holding goals. There's lots of those in Twitter, and I'm going to talk about Twitter next, because this is how an awful lot of teachers around the world have started galvanizing support, supporting each other through a movement called Teach SDGs. I don't know how many of you, if any, use Twitter. I'm big on it, so link to me if you're there. But we all linked up through the Sustainable Development Goals and share projects and this amazing collaborations going on. Two of our um, ambassadors were finalists for the Varki Foundation Global Educator of the Year Award last year, um, and 17 of us founding ambassadors so it's become much, much bigger. I think there's about 26,000 Twitter followers. It's organic. It's linking teachers around the world who want to support each other and share projects. Cohen Timmers, one of the pictures at the bottom, he's got an amazing project with some colleagues linking 85 countries, and they take themes, and the most recent one I think was gender, um, and share resources and projects. So lots and lots going on. Um, some of the benefits of this, um, how, how am I doing? Oh, 11 minutes, so I'm okay. Some of the benefits of uh, engaging with the sustainable development goals in schools um, that I've been collecting case studies and anecdotal evidence and hopefully more concrete and rigorous evidence will come to the fore. Um, but teachers have talked to me about the Sustainable Development Goals being a wonderful uh, golden thread that bridges subject divides. It's a wonderful way of bringing in complex local national uh, issues into the classroom, that distancing pedagogic te technique. Um, it's collectively owned, which is... Um, a really interesting one for the methodologies that get used because teachers and students are on the same starting point. Often they know as much as each other about some of these issues uh, and it's about the skills to go away and research and, and move towards action. Um, it's been an interesting tool as well for transition between primary and secondaries, lovely examples of students reverse mentoring um, and teaching parents and community groups, but also going into primary schools and sharing their learning. Um, some of the, uh, a separate talk in its entirety is how it maps to some of the 21st century skills and competences, the discourse surrounding that, either from P21 or PISA or OECD. Um, I think one of the most significant things for me personally, and the human stories behind all this stuff, are, it's always important in my opinion, um, is how it has been quite motivating for teachers to finally find a language to convey the sort of passion and mission that they have in schools. Um, and uh, creating really innovative practice and ideas to, and, and uniting teachers, even if they might be in totally C.P. Snow's two cultures, totally opposite cultures. One might be a, a mathematician and one might be a, a historian or a scientist, but they are finding collaborative projects through sustainable development goal themes. Um, and then the other thing is engaging other community groups, which is, I think, quite important. Okay, so um, one of the ways in which we, some fantastic work's going on, and this is not just in the UK, in lots of other countries, and some of it's detailed in um, uh, journals like the International Journal of Development, Education and Global Learning. Um, I've a couple of other images up there is a very successful award that we have in schools called the Rights Respecting School Award. Um, and then uh, Oxfam's um, curriculum and, and guidance for teaching global citizenship. And in fact, I'm writing something for them right now on teaching the sustainable development goals. Um, but there's lots of ways of deepening engagement with some of the themes through global learning, 
through some of the pedagogies that you're exploring in some of the workshops today. Um, the human story element of it, we're lucky in the UK, we have an awful lot of NGOs that work to support schools um, to foster critical global citizenship education. I know that's not the case everywhere, um, although with funding shifts we'll see how many have survived. Um, <laughs> and th there's, there's lots of other ways in which you can deepen engagement by working in, with students to lead on this. Students often lead some really interesting projects. And there's a little video there, if I'd have a time, of some, some student-led projects in a primary school in London. Um, but the important thing, obviously, is that the we also convey that although this universal framework for action is very useful, it is not without its critics. It has an ideology, it has faults, it has critiques. And this is also where critical global citizenship education is useful because it's very much about being clear about different perspectives, partial truths. I've noticed that the OSDE um, methodology is, is, has, is something some of you are familiar with through the program, and that is linked to a critical approach to global learning. Um, I sometimes show this video, I won't now, but um, I recommend it. Um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's talk on the dangers of the single story, because it's a beautiful articulation of um, how we have to find the alternative voices and the alternative narratives wherever possible. Um, if I could show it to you, I would. <laughs> but what that sort of resource, which is great for teacher training, as, and it's also great for some of all the students, is it starts articulating a division between softer and more critical global citizenship education um, from my, my good friend and colleague, um, Professor Angiotti, um, where it's about sometimes reframing the, the issue and the theme. And I think that came up a little bit in the first two presentations, where the problem is not poverty or helplessness, it's about inequality and injustice. One of the big things in the Global Learning Program was moving schools and teachers from a charity mentality to a social justice mentality. We have a big thing in, in UK schools. My kids regularly have to take in a pound for a charity event, but they don't know what the charity event is or the issue is because there's not time to go into it in more depth. Um, so the nature of the problem then is, is ref reframed with a more critical global learning approach, that it's not just about a lack of something, um, but it's about a complex system quite difficult to, to get that into primary schools, but it's possible. There's some fantastic stuff out there. Um, and that our basis for caring is not just that we're responsible, it's that we're responsible towards and that we need to learn critically. Another video, if I'd had time, we don't have time, do we? But there, um, a video that is from um, Rusty Radiators Award, um, uh, Radiators for Norway, and it's a, a wonderful, video of how we stereotype in some of our charity messaging and we need to be better at engaging with the truth. Um, have we got time for just two minutes for this? Yeah? I need to turn the volume up. How do I turn the volume up? Uh, go back to the beginning. Oh no, now we've gone backwards. Try again. It's not, the volume's not been there. Yeah, I can hear it, but not. Oh, it doesn't matter too much, it doesn't matter too much. Yeah, um, but it's a critical approach, if you like, um, and they've, they have produced some great resources for, again, different ways of engaging with some of these themes um, and the danger of the stereotype and the danger of creating single stories. Um, because that's the methodology that I think supports um, engaging with the sustainable development goals and would really better support themes like migration. Um, and I, I, I suppose then, to summarize then, the, I think the sustainable development goals are a wonderful framework for helping educational institutions and teachers 
engage more with these complex issues because of the way they frame them, but that we need to do it carefully and critically and, and, and um, collaboratively. When the beauty of it also is no one's the expert here, or there are experts out there, but on the whole, our overview is, 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 is a holistic, generalised one, and getting into the deeper, more complex issues is hard. Um, but it's just totally possible and really, really motivating when people get it right. Um, but that gives us a few minutes for questions, if you've got any. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. And now, if we have any questions, please raise your hands. Oh, that's our Twitters, by the way, and that's, that's our Teach SDGs Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, do, do join Teach SDGs. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Harriet. Um, I wanted to just go back to the very beginning of your presentation and the interesting link you made between uh, digital literacy, critical literacy, and global citizenship skills, and just ask you really about that tension between, um, you know, skills for uh, global competitiveness as opposed to skills for global cooperation, which is a tension perhaps that runs through this work and has run through this work for some time and I don't think is entirely resolved as well when we talk about um, developing um, uh, you know, competencies. Often we're talking about the kinds of things that are, need to be measurable and data driven and, and then can be rated against um, competencies in other contexts. So yeah, it was just to really ask for your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's something that's uh, been of interest to me for many years, this sort of tension between a more performance-based, what I yeah. have called in an article once, instrumentalism, and, and a more social justice instrumentalism for our ult ultimate motives for engaging with this. We have to do both, because otherwise we exclude our audiences, like businesses and the corporate sector, which are vital to their voices, is vital in these discussions. Um, and that the, the most beautiful, wonderful, organic social justice education work goes on, but sometimes in total isolation from the, the more corporate discourse that we have to also be engaging with because that is dominant in so many circles. So there is a tension, but it can be negotiated and navigated. And I wonder sometimes whether the AI te digital technology is a way into um, addressing that tension a little bit because both have to get to grips with it. We all have to get to grips with it. Um, and framing things in terms of 21st century skills and competences is also another way of doing it. Um, we work with uh, f we all work with frameworks that underpin everything we do uh, in education. It tends to be a human rights type framework or social justice type framework. Uh, and we start by recognizing that, but recognizing not everyone works that way. And that, that where is the power? Who has the power in deciding what ultimate policy takes place? And to exclude those voices would be foolish. <laughs> yeah, it's a tension. It, I think it'll always be that. that yeah. yeah. Thank you. Shall I? Hey, yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, hi there. Thanks for your talk. Um, I, I'm just interested. You frame the, this kind of um, sort of contradiction between this charity discourse and rights-based discourse, um, and I think. Um, in addition to that, there's also kind of the idea of um, self-interest and the way that sometimes migration, for instance, is framed as a benefit to the state, yes. um, as, as we heard um, at the beginning of the um, day, um, thinking about um, GDP and um, contributions that uh, new arrivals can make to the country. Um, and so I wonder how that pulls us away as well from rights-based discourses, um, the idea of just thinking about how um, these new arrivals can be r really a boon to the state. Um, and it's difficult because when talking about migration, you want to debunk the idea that new arrivals are a drain on the state, um, but in focusing on kind of the benefits that they might bring in terms of GDP, I feel like it does take us away from the, the deeper questions around why migration must happen, needs to happen, needs to be pr protected. Yeah, I'm not sure I got an answer to that because I think you've sort of <laughs> answered that, that, that within your question. I, I think it's the... The, the t it's another tension, isn't it? Um, and the, I think we have to unpack the messages of 
of why migration is a good thing. And, and, and we can do that through critical global learning, I believe, by uh, supporting the, uh, the skills that are required to do that. And sometimes it's about reframing the question. And this isn't strictly answering this, but actually it's brought me to the point I made earlier about sometimes there's a call for lots of problem-based learning. And my, t my concern with that, it puts huge weight on the shoulders of young people to solve the world's problems, or if you're going to assess them based on their ultimate outcome, if they have an action and to change things, do they somehow fail if they don't? Actually, the skill of reframing a question and thinking the problem around a problem totally differently is an incredible skill in itself, which is sometimes what's needed with that tension. I haven't fully answered that, I'm aware of that, but... It's my best shot. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, we have a last one. Firstly, thank you for the presentation. And I know as a UK, you have a lot of experience in dealing with a variety of different people in your country. Could you tell us uh, a secret recipe of what to teach, uh, what skills teachers need to have to work with a diversity of a children, variety of them? Because uh, we are from Education Science Ministry and uh, our teachers uh, lack of some skills in working with uh, different children. So maybe you have any secret recipe for that? Thanks. Oh, if only I did. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, diversity, yes. I, I mean, again, I think we're quite lucky in the UK. There's an awful lot of research and sometimes investment that's gone into that issue of dealing with diversity within the classroom. Lots of wonderful resources, a lot of free actually, so you, if you can work with the English language is fine. Um, but linked to sort of critical global learning again, it's creating those safe spaces for open dialogue and expression, and it is not easy. It does require professional development and training and supporting teachers going on a, a learning journey themselves because they may not have experienced diversity themselves in the way that they are now experiencing within the classrooms. So, so the, the professional support and development, I think, is a crucial part of that, um, which, again, I think there's lots of opportunities to do that. And learning from other countries and other contexts where that's happened is, it would be from my point of view, your first start. I don't think there's any secret answers, but um, I, I do think there's a lot of people who've thought about that issue in great depth. Um, and, and so there are, uh, there is a lot out there to draw upon, which is the good side. 